Yo, what's going on, people? You are listening to the Mo Gilligan podcast. Um, today's guest who joins me, I'm really excited to have today's guest on because when I really got into this TV space, it was someone that reached out just at the right time. I don't know <laughs> if you know this, Reggie. No. But when you reached out to me and you said, bruv, I love what you're doing. Keep it up. It was just at the right time where I was getting into that space. Right. And I was understanding it. And for me, I've always looked at you as someone who's like, bro, like Reggie just does it good though. <laughs> you know what I mean, bro? Like- I and appreciate that. And, and reason why I say that, yeah, because when you, you know, you've gone from like, you, you know, you're presenting, you know, now you're writing, you're doing films. Yeah. Even some of your documentaries is so like, to see sometimes, sometimes to see you in certain spaces is like, bro, like it's possible. Like last, what was it? I think it was last year. There was that film premiere. Um, is it for Queen and Slim? Okay. Yeah. And I see you there and I said, bruv, a documentary in China? Sick, you know? <laughs> because it was like, that's someone who is like, looks like me and sounds like me, is in China doing a documentary. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, and I remember you was like, yeah, you know, it was, and I was like, but fam, like, I enjoyed it, fam. Yeah. Because it makes it like possible that you can go China and do a documentary, you can go South Africa, you can go yeah. Russia and do all these things. But at the same time, I was like, Reggie's a good guy, bro. He's a nice guy, you know? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I so, appreciate it. Thank my you, My friend, welcome to the Mo Gilligan podcast. It's good to be um, here. No, it's good to be here. I'll go one step further and I'll sort of throw it back to you and say that, you know, like what you're doing is is really beautiful. And I don't want this to be a blow smoke section of the show, mm. but like, let's, let's get it out of the way so we can cuss each other for the next hour, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. No, but genuinely, I think that at this point, uh, someone who has been in the business for 30 years now, right? Mm. To be at a point where there are people who have gone from an organic space into a space that is very sort of controlled and uh, very much sort of zeros and ones. The mm. people have decided that you should be seen and mm. you should be heard. And for you to go from that space to going into a place where people have to mess with you because mm. of what you've done is beautiful. And to know that, there are several people who have been chosen by the people that look like us, mm. who are really being taken seriously, mm. as well as people who have come from more traditional roots, like I have, mm. existing in the same space and at the same time rubbing shoulders yeah. means a lot because, you know, the generation prior to mine and the generation that I'm a part of that uh, have come through the ranks in television, there was never really that level of mixing, that level of support, that level of brotherhood. Whereas now it feels like, Regardless of how you got here, you're here. Mm. And if you're good, you will be supported, you will be embraced and you will be encouraged. And that is powerful, bro. Yeah. So like ratings to you, man. No, I love lot, what man. you're doing. I love it. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for yeah, having me. No, thanks a lot, man. I remember the first time I ever met you was so funny because it was that, um, so, you know, Marvin Harrison, of course. Yeah. When he was doing Sunday show and Sunday show done a, they done like a big Sunday show okay. basically in... It was a mermaid theatre. Okay. Now, you don't know this, but I know this. So basically, yeah. <laughs> There's too many of these stories, you know. I don't like when people start telling me stories like, you won't remember this yet, but go on. What well, happened? I remember at the show, right? So this is the time when I'm first starting mm. comedy, really. And when I say first starting, this is where I'm really performing to my peers as such. Right. But it's weird because at a time when I was starting comedy, I didn't really start the conventional way of, I go to a club and I do a five minutes. I'm doing Sunday show at a theater in front of 600 people. Yeah. And I remember the beginning of the show, right? I remember Jazzy was there and we was gonna play this, um, we was gonna play this kind of game on stage or something. I can't remember what it was. And like, I remember looking around and I think you got there a little bit early right. and I seen you at the, like, the bottom of the stairs. Cause you know, like the celebrities, they get them first two, three seats. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, then I went up to you and I was like, What's going on, Reggie, man? Love your stuff, man. You was loving. You was like, yeah, man, big up, man. Nice to meet you. I was like, listen, man, I'm doing this game, bro. I love to get you involved. <laughs> he was like, yeah, I'm just here to enjoy myself, you know? <laughs> <laughs> because, because a part of me was like, I'm a bit happy, but I'm like, oh, I swear. <laughs> you just enjoy yourself, yeah. Oh, come on, you got to admit, that's a risk, though. <laughs> no, no, 100%. That's a risk. Do you know what it is? For me at that time, I was just like, like, ah, oh, let me just ask. Cause yeah, I, yeah, of course. I get it now. Of course. Now I'm in that position. I, <laughs> I get that now. Cause I'm like, oh, I just want to watch comedy, bruv. Yeah. Kind of thing. No, no disrespect. But for me, I was like, oh, hey, cool, man. 
Bro, but I'm embarrassed because. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry, man. I didn't mean anything, right? No, no, but, but you know like, what? You, did, man, you know what it's like no, when you're in that position 100%. where you're like, this could go left. 100%. And there's an audience. Yes. I don't want that to yeah. happen. Do you know what it is? I think for me at that age, I was so like, I was very like, um, I was very fearless yeah, when I yeah. first started comedy. I was just like, I really want to be funny. I want to be the best in the room. And I think that's why when I look back at that young Mo back in the day, to, to almost like, right, nice to meet you, man. You want to be in this comedy thing? Mm. It's like, it's like, but I, I look back, I'm like, Mo, relax. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's not that deep, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that was, that that for me, you know, especially like when I was starting out doing comedy and just seeing you in certain places and envi environments, it was like, oh, bro, man, sick. Like, <laughs> it, it was quite nice to see because I think I'd never seen it before. Right. So when I was like, you know, I went to I went to one of your parties. Is it the tra trading places? You once? came to trading. Came to a trading places once. What bro. was the? Do you remember the venue? I remember. This is uh, I think it was Concrete in Shoreditch. Okay, right. Concrete wow. in Shoreditch. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But that for me was was that kind of blew my mind because that's the first time I'd been in a space and been amongst other people within the you know like kind of media industry yeah. TV. But it was people just relaxed. Yeah, yeah. This wasn't, you know, now I go to, you know, you get to go to like the BAFTAs and stuff like yeah, that, yeah. where it's work. Where well, do you know what? We should probably give it some context because trading places, mm -hmm. it doesn't exist anymore. Yes. Uh, only like fondly in our sort of memories. And there are still pictures online. If you look for it, you yeah. can find yeah, them, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So trading place was a party that I used to throw with a friend of mine called A-Side. A-Side at the time worked at Nike. He was like mm -hmm. one of their marketing guys. Now A-Side works with Yeezy and um, he does. A, he lives in Los Angeles and does look a whole that. bunch of stuff, yeah, right? Yeah, that's sick. And um, <clears throat> Ace and I were super close. Yeah. And um, we had this party that we wanted to throw that was sort of, a party for us and our, our friends, right? Mm. So he had this thing called The Most Influential, which was a, a blog that he ran with a bunch of different writers. Mm. I had a website called A Tribe Called Next, which was um, a bunch of young writers who've all gone on to direct and write and do all kinds of cool stuff. And then yeah, we, yeah, yeah. Uh, we thought, let's throw a party for us. Mm. And that party, because of the demand at the time for a club night that felt different and felt special had to be secret. Mm. So we put out these invites that like told you the name of the party and the date and the time, but it wouldn't have any address on it. And it mm. was like for guest list, holler at your connect. Essentially, wow. if you know me or you know Ace, yeah. give us a shout. If you don't, it's not really for you. <laughs> so yeah. it was one of them things where it was like, either you were one of our close friends yeah. or you were a plus one. Yes. And that's it. That's how I came as a plus one. Still. Right. And and, and <laughs> yeah. it was just controlled. And it wasn't about being bougie. It was yeah. about controlling the space that was sacred. Mm. So it would be people that do what we do, our friends, people from sports and entertainment and everybody, as you said, could be relaxed. Like we did some mad parties. We threw parties yeah. for Jay Electronica. We did parties yeah. with Kanye. We had, we had Kanye perform on a plank piano. We had Serena Williams, Jeezy perform. We had all kinds wow. of mad stuff happen. We had um, Questlove DJ, Q-Tip DJ, like, Everyone, we we paid Questlove a bottle of Jack to mm -hmm. DJ at one of our parties. What? Yeah, and we had him play in Hackney. Like we had him come to Hackney. <laughs> yeah. Like we did all kinds of things. And um, trading was really special because the people that were the foundation, like the people that made that party special now do incredible things like Grace who manages Skepta and mm -hmm. Irene was like, Irene who does every sort of event and puts on every party, works with Wizkid, does loads of amazing things. She was sent to the dance floor. She was the party star. My brother, who's like a costume designer for movies now, yeah, like yeah. bare different people came through trading mm -hmm. and have gone on to do amazing things. So when you look at the picture, like Ross, where does Ed Sheeran? Is that Jesse J? Like, is that blah, blah? Is that da, 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 da? Mm -hmm. Is that Adrian Zoba? Like, what's Kano doing there? Right, that's Amy Winehouse. Oh my yeah. God, that's Moss Def. Like, it was really, really special. Yeah, that really was, special. that's what you're saying is literally going, that was what was happening through my mind when I went. <laughs> because I remember, as I said, I was I was someone's plus one. Yeah. So when I did get there, I was like, oh, bro, this is, oh my days, bro, this, bro, it's Reggie Yates. I see Amy Winehouse in there, bro. Yeah. I was like, hey, big man, it's Amy Winehouse. <laughs> <laughs> and the person I was with was just like, yeah, this is normal, innit? I'm like, this ain't normal to me, bro. <laughs> it's not normal to me, but, bro. But, that, but that's what's really beautiful about it. And like uh, being like, I, I think the perception of me is that I'm younger than I actually am because yeah. I've always been the young guy in a space with people who are older than me or mm. people who look and feel a similar age. Mm -hmm. I sort of grew up in an era where we used to look at the Americans and we used to say, I, I want to do what they're doing. Like, yeah. you know, uh, what Puffy and Jay do with their brunch, the Rock Nation brunch every year. Like mm. people are trying to recreate that over here now. Yes. That idea of recreating what has happened in America mm. didn't really exist in my formative years. People mm -hmm. in my teens and twenties, in, in, in their teens and twenties as I was coming up, 
would just sort of keep it local and keep it small. There was never this mm. thing of what would it look like if we did that our way, yes. you know? And um, I always have sort of thought, what would it be like if we had our own Spikes or we had our own John Singletons or we had our own Oprahs and not trying to be them, but, you know, it, it taking their ambition and yeah, just transplanting yeah. it here to the UK. Mm-hmm. And uh, for me, that event wasn't about being bougie or being better than anyone. It was like, what does it feel like to be around your peers mm. and actually go, all right, um, Rio Ferdinand, come to this club night and you can stand next to um, a young musician who nobody knows yet, but mm. next year he's going to be Tiny Temper. Yeah, Do you know yeah. what I mean? And that that's the, that's was... the one I went to. Oh, where Tiny performed. Okay. Yes. And yeah. I think that was the first time I met Tiny and, and Dumi. They was both there together. Pass yeah. Out had just come out. Yeah, he performed Pass Out that night. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, very much like, well, go on, Tiny. You know, right? <laughs> and the maddest thing is the night before, Tiny had just gone number one. Oh, right. So he had just gone number one and he had an after party at a club uh, behind um, near Carnaby. It's kind of like, so you've got Carnaby Street on one side and you've got ha- um, Hamleys on yeah, the other side. Yeah, yeah. It's be a small little club there. So okay. I went, I was able to go to that. And for me, I was like, oh my gosh, look all these people here. Mm-hmm. Wow. There's, there's Keisha from Sugar Babes there, bruv. <laughs> bruv. And then the next day I went to, I went to your trading place, which again blew my mind. So I'm like, oh my days, is Amy Winehouse there. <laughs> and then it's like, you're saying tiny. I, I ain't gonna lie. I remember when I was there, I was like, right, I want to stay. But the person I came was like, yeah, I'm going now. <laughs> so I was like, I need that lift because yeah. I'm broke. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that, you know what? Your event was the first event I ever went to and drinks were free. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> get in there. And I was like, yeah, can I get, um, <laughs> get a coat, please? And I'm like, I didn't ask for that. No charge. Just, just walk away with the juice. <laughs> Just keep walking. But you know, the beautiful thing about that is that that is something that has happened that we can look back on with fond memories. And the thing, mm. the place that I'm at now is what does the next layer of that look like? Yeah, you know? yeah, 100%. What does it feel like to say to 20 people, look, come to this venue, come and sit down, have dinner mm. and let's just talk mm. and let's just really get into what each other's doing. And out of that, new bonds may be created and potentially business or something creative could come from that. Mm. That's where it's got to now partially because you know I'm too old to stay up late yeah, but also yeah, yeah. because I just want to talk to people like yeah, I don't yeah. want to just be in the same room as someone dancing with them or mm. dancing on the other side of the room I just kind of want to get in their head and yeah, know yeah, who they yeah. are and that's where it progresses to but I will always be about trying to move the finish line further forward because yeah, yeah. having a party where everyone's having free champagne is great yeah but what's the next version of that? What's the next layer? How do we actually create from that, grow from that, inspire, build and become something more? What was your route like getting into TV? Because I know you started in TV when you was very young as yeah. well. So how was that How was that for you when you first started? It's hard, man. Um, it was hard because I was a very aware child. So I was very aware of the fact that I was the only black boy in the room mm. or like I'd be in an audition with a bunch of guys that looked like me every week. And we'd all be fighting for the same parts. Mm. And one week it would be Ashley Waters, one week it'd be me, one week it'd be someone else. And it's almost like you're all singing for your supper, but there's Mm. only one meal to go around. And even as a kid, it felt dead. I didn't like that, you know? Mm. Um, I grew up up the road from where we are now in in Holloway. And um, I always had way too much energy as a kid. I mean, I told the story before, so I try and give a truncated version of it. But Mm. at like eight years old, my mum, tried me at different things. So she sent me to junior gunners. I was crap at football. I didn't, I didn't make it. Mm. I didn't want to do scouts because I hated the way that they, they, that they dressed. Like I didn't want to wear them shorts and a neckerchief. I wasn't into none of that. (laughs) And then a friend told her about this um, (laughs) drama club called Anna Cher in Islington, um, in, in Angel. And at that time it was 50p a lesson. And then it went up to two pound 50 and we were outraged. Like I'll never forget. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just a drama club that you'd go to once a week and you'd sort of do drama, you do improvisation, you'd like dance, you do all kinds of crazy stuff. And they also had an agency attached, which essentially meant if you were a big enough show off, you got noticed and then you get put on the agency and then you go out for auditions. And I was fortunate enough to start going for auditions quite quickly and start working quite quickly. And that was my way in really. Um, It was just my mum trying to find some way to harness my energy because if I wasn't drawing, I was playing. If I wasn't playing, I would do, I would do radio shows in my bedroom, bruv. Like I swear, this ain't a lie, I swear down. I would have two radios. My uncle Felix got me a little ghetto blaster for my birthday and I'd take my mum's one from the kitchen that was covered in red oil that she kept above the, the cooker and then, like, all the oil used to splat on it. I'd take that one, <laughs> yeah. I'd put that on one side, I'd put it on the other side and I'd turn up WNK on this side yeah. and like I'd be playing a record, 
turn it down, do a link and then turn up Kiss, which was a pirate at the same time as well. Yes. Like WNK yeah, yeah, and Kiss, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they were fighting for the legal licenses. Mm. Um, and in North London, you could sometimes get choice because it was hard to get. So mm. like I, there were the stations that I'd turn up and down and I'd do a link between the stations, like Jeez. eight or nine years old. Like I'd turn one up, play a song, turn it down, do a link to myself in my bedroom <laughs> yeah, yeah. and then turn the other one up. Like I was, a, I was an idiot. My yeah, mum would yeah, like yeah. watch me as a kid going, who is this you? Like, what <laughs> yeah. is this picnic? Like, what is this? What did yeah, God give me? Yeah. And then she sent me to the place and off the back of being there, I just started working and it was just really beautiful because the jobs just kept coming and I kept going. And fortunately, and long may it continue, God willing, um, mm. it hasn't really stopped. Yeah. And in terms of working in that space, you know, you went on to present as well. Yeah. yeah. Doing kids TV as well. Mm. So how was that transition of going? Because I feel like then you're kind of really, you're, you're in the industry as such. So it's almost like the next chapter. Because even yeah. when I was doing stand up like early on, it was almost like, you must do presenting. Yeah, yeah. So how how did you kind of fall in? Did you want to do presenting as Bro, well? I was like, so I started when I was eight. Yeah. I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. Like my first presenting gig was a London Underground safety video and I was 10. Mm -mm. And I was given a script. I learned the script and I was like doing links. Yeah. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just given a script. I had to learn it. This time I wasn't pretending that I was someone else. I was myself and I was allowed to talk to the camera. Oh, those are the rules. It's just yeah. a game when you're that old, you know? Yeah, so I yeah. would just talk down the camera and do it. And then when Disney Club came along, when I was like 12, suddenly it was more, I was like, oh, so you want me to do the thing that I did on that? I right, can't, whatever. And I did it and it was just like, oh, you got the job. And I was like, all right, whatever. And at that age, it's just normal. Like mm. you don't realize that what you're doing is different or weird because in your drama group that is full up with kids from your estate or from your area, mm. um, like everybody did it. In, in Islet and in Hackney, like Kalua was in my class at one point. Yeah. Um, Leon from flipping um, Rudimental was in my class at one point. Mm. Dizzy went Anna's for a few, like for a little bit, like loads of people went, let alone yeah. the people that actually went on to have careers in TV. Like Naomi Harris was in my class. Like she's yeah. a Hackney girl, you know? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. everybody in the area just went. Mm. And if you got work, you did. And if you didn't, whatever. It, well, my sister used to go and she didn't get any work and it mm. didn't matter because it wasn't for her. So, I think for me, it was just second nature. It only became weird when people started to recognize me or treat me differently because mm. of it. You know, that was when I was like, oh, this is something that makes other people feel a way about me. Yeah. And that was before I even had you know, hair on my chest. Like I was like 13, 12, 13 years old going, oh, this is weird because I do this thing that I like that I don't really care about. Mm. You feel differently. Yeah. about me, even though you don't really know who I am. Mm -hmm. And it was teachers. It wasn't even so much like my classmates. My classmates yeah. would say something and forget about it in the next minute. Mm. But when teachers started treating me differently, mm. I was like, okay. In a good or a bad way? Always terrible. Mm. Like I wasn't sort of uh, elevated above my classmates because I was on Desmond's one week or because I did a, an advert. Like I'll never forget my, um, <clears throat> my secondary school headmaster, Mr. Marshall, blocked me from doing a McDonald's advert. And I was a straight A student at this part point. And he didn't have a reason. He mm -hmm. just didn't want me to do it. Wow. And like, I was straight A's, well behaved, like wasn't fighting, wasn't, and everyone was fighting in my school. At that point, in, I, went, I went Central Asian Boys School in Old Street. And like, we used to play black v white football mm. at lunchtime because it was a racist, there was like loads of racist schools. We had junior NF in our school, White Cross, one of the biggest states near my, near oh, my school had a massive boy. racist gang. Like it was, race was a big thing in my school. Yeah. And I'll never forget like blacks v whites football at lunch. Mm. And I wasn't even getting in fights, yeah. even during that time. Like I was navigating my way around it by jokes and cussing people and laughing and whatever, or running away, whatever it was. Mm. So for me to get blocked because of that, I was like, right, you feel a way about me doing this. And mm. I don't know why. Yeah, and yeah. you sort of, your antenna goes up. Okay, this is, the, the rules are different for mm. me now. That must be very hard as well when you're kind of at a place now, because now you know, schools champion that, mm. that child who's doing TV or doing music or football. I remember being in school and there's, you know, someone who's, you know, an actor. It's not that they get special treatment, but they're almost like, guys, that's the example. <laughs> you know, we had a couple of famous people that went to my school. We had um, uh, the girl who's in the Queen's Nose. Okay, yeah, yeah. I felt really, looking back, I felt quite sorry for her because people just go up to her and be like, yo, what well, on? You got 50p you can rub a nut like. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> I was one of them people. <laughs> so when you say people, you mean you, you used to go up to her and say still. that. All right, okay. But I ended up, what it was, um, when I went to sixth form, 
Like she was good friends with one of my friends at the time. Yeah. So I think it's like, what was her name? Uh, Ella remember? Jones. Ella I think Jones. she was. I think she was at Anna's. Maybe yeah. Yeah I think yeah, she was. yeah yeah. But you know the maddest thing is when she came to our school. That felt like a big signing. That right. felt like we just <laughs> got name up. Yeah, if there was anyone famous, that's a big signing for your school. Because you go back, you'd be like, bruv, you know my girl from Queens? No, she goes to our school, you know, yeah, bruv. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So she felt like a big signing, man. <laughs> like there was other people in like higher years. In terms of lower years, we had, um, oh, it's so hard because I know I'm going to miss some people. Oh, I forgot his name, but he's in... Um, Ah, oh, Love Actually. Okay. The young kid that's in oh, Love yeah. Actually. He's, he's still making quite, movies now. Yeah, 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 a lot of films. Mm. And I didn't know him, but I remember him being about in the school. So I've, I'm two years older than him, right? Mm. And I remember <laughs> walking through Soho once and I see him and he had like a guitar. He's obviously come out of some kind of studio or something mm. like that, right? So he's walking with his guitar and he wanted his old car. Like, you know, like an old classic car, yeah, innit? Yeah. But it weren't flashy. Yeah, it, yeah. But you know, you look at a car like, that is easily 60 bags. That's money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember seeing him. I was like, nah, man. Let's just... <laughs> I didn't know you like that in school, bro. <laughs> I'll just be making it right now. <laughs> but I think what one thing I'm definitely fascinated about is, you know, you, you got into, you, you got into this career like very young mm. and getting fame at a time where there wasn't social media. Yeah. How was that? Because that, I always feel like fame back then is like, Fame. People come up and ask for an autograph. There's no mm, picture yeah. evidence yeah. or anything. <laughs> How did that affect your, men your 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 mental health growing up? Oh man. Um, first of all, no one's ever asked me that question. Mm. Second of all, there was nothing to compare it to mm. because there wasn't social media. Mm. There wasn't an awareness of mental health. There wasn't anyone to look at as an example and say, "I'm going through what they're going through." Mm. So. The truth is you just, it was just your normality. Mm. Yeah, occasionally people would ask for an autograph, but the obsession with celebrity didn't exist then in the way that it does today. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I didn't really have to deal with stuff that my equivalent today would have to deal with. Yes. You know what I mean? Like today, it's we're catching up to America in a way where you can be big in your area and you can be a superstar where you're from, but mean nothing when you go to Manchester, you know? Mm that wasn't the case when I was growing up. Like yeah. if you were on anything, it was national, mm. be that radio or TV. Therefore people knew you across the country. Mm. It was not localized because there weren't even MSN yet, you know? Mm. So I'm massively aging myself here, but that was the reality. It was, yeah, yeah, it course. was, it was just different. It was, um, yeah. If people stopped you on the street, you'd done something. Mm. And I like, I'm really thankful for this. And I'm thankful that I came up in the area that I, I came up in. And that is because things have been gradual. You know, every year things have stepped up a notch. I've done something with a slightly higher profile and a slightly higher profile. And it's now got to the point 30 years later where it's like, oh, that's just Reg, isn't it? Mm. And you're just sort of there. You're kind of part of the furniture. I mean, it's a lovely place to be, but it has its pitfalls. It has its complications. But at the same time, I'm massively thankful for not being part of this era. Like I have to throw the question back to you. Like social media is so tied to your notoriety and your success. 100%. How much does that like, does that affect you? Because mm. I don't, sometimes I don't want to look at my phone yeah, and I can avoid it. Mm -hmm. But when your audience is so ready to see you in the way that they're used to seeing you, and that happens to be through the thing that you just want to put away, mm. Do you lose that battle sometimes? Do you have to mess with your phone when you don't want to even look at it? I remember the first, when I first started really gaining, gaining an, an, an uh, online audience, mm. that was where I was like, whoa, I've got this online, online audience. Now I really have to go full gear at this, create sketches. There was one time I think I was almost putting up, I think I was putting up three or four sketches a week. And this was when I was working at retail. Wow. And I kept carrying that on because I was like, I've got to keep this machine running. Mm. Keep going, keep going, keep going. And for me, it was really fun because I was like, well, never. this has never happened. It's like a little bit like what you're saying. Like I have nothing to compare it to, but I'm just going to keep putting out a sketch, another sketch. Mm. Then what was happening? Each sketch is going up. Something different's changing. Oh, so solid follow me. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That was a big deal for me. Yeah, of course. Like, oh, so solid's following me. Oh my gosh, cool. Then I'm putting out something else. My friends are like, bro, you know Drake's following you. I'm like, Drake. <laughs> whoa, got to do some really good stuff now. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And then it goes a higher level where you're, I'm out in the street and someone's like, right, you're, you're that couple of cans guy or mm. I see your stuff, but they don't really know your name. Mm -hmm. And that's quite hard to deal with because you're like, I'm a 
person. Yeah. But there's also this other person saying, I know who you are. So I'm like, I want you to know my name, but at the same time, I still need to keep churning out these videos till I get to a point where you do know my name. Mm. So I had to keep putting out these videos. Then tours happen. You know, mm. we've done the tour, which was a big deal. Now I didn't know the tour would take off in the way that it did. I was very much like, yeah, we do a couple of shows. If it goes well, it goes well. And then you add dates. Yeah. And then you add more dates. And this is the thing, right? When we, when we was adding those dates, it was like, like bang, bang, bang. We're doing, we're, we're on tour and we're adding dates at the mm. same time. So while I'm going to a show, I can see that I'm getting a text message, by the way, Birmingham sold out tonight, thousand people. I'm like, rah. And then we're going to another show. And it's that thing where sometimes you see sold out on a billboard and I'm going to shows be like, it's packed, it's sold out. Whereas before my reality was like, is there going to be anyone in tonight? Mm. Because if there's no one in, I ain't going to get paid. That was my reality. Whereas now I'm like going to shows and people know who I am. They're coming out for me. I remember going past, remember we was in Birmingham and there was a queue and I seen my name on the billboard. I was like, rah, my name's on the billboard, bruv. So we stopped and took a picture <laughs> and we came back from, so he was in, he was in Birmingham, right? So we went, went to the ball and I had to get a fresh t-shirt. We came back, which was a regular occurrence for me. Like <laughs> I always have to get a fresh t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> like we came back and I see people queuing up and I'm like, right, they're queuing up for me. Yeah. There's a thousand people in a city I'm not from. So for me, for my mental health, I just had to keep putting into this machine. It's, it's almost like a train. You know, when you see a train that someone's putting in coal mm. and it keeps it going. Yeah. That's kind of felt like where my mental health was going and my soul and all my energy. And what happens like, when you run out of coal? Putting it. And that's the difference. When you run out of coal, then you're like, whoa, like I don't, there's times, I remember there was times where I was performing towards the end of the, the tour and I could be performing on stage to, let's say like 600 people in a room mm. in Manchester or whatever, right? but my mind is not there. So I'm thinking of something totally different, but I'm performing a set. And it's so weird because I've asked other comics, it's like, have you ever had that? It's like, yeah, I've done that before. But that feels like the most alien experience ever because yeah. it's like it's like me saying I'm talking right now, but in my head, I'm thinking about washing the dishes. Yeah. Red, red, red. yeah. And I think when once that happens, that's when I was like, I kind of just want to have a break from it now because I'm not enjoying it. Yes. You know, there's times when we was on, we was on tour, I started doing new material. I'm doing like 15, 20 minutes of new stuff because I was so bored of doing the same stuff. Yeah, people are coming out, but I was like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not enjoying it. Mm. Everyone else around me is enjoying it, but not me. So I think that's when I kind of had to really like, be like, okay, cool. What do I really want to do? Yeah. Because I want to start enjoying this. And I think once I got into TV and I got a, I got to be in a place where I got to be creative in TV and people trusted me. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, this is cool. This is really fun. Yeah. I really enjoy this because I'm, I'm not just on TV. I'm I'm in the room. I get I, I get a say on stuff, and I think that's where I really started to kind of home in more on my 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 mental health, really. Yeah. Because when you're outside and you know someone wants a picture, you don't feel like he's like everyone wants a picture, but they don't want to be like oh well, go on like your name's Mo, mm. isn't it? Nice to meet you. It's almost like right, big man, let me get a picture. And I was like, okay, cool. I just felt like I had to do it as opposed to now. I'm like, yeah, man, cool. I get a picture like. Cool, man. Do you want to say thanks? Like, or please? <laughs> like, it's those small things. And it's not me being a diva, but sometimes every time I'll get a picture of someone and they wouldn't say thanks. And, you know, there's times we'd we'll be on tour, you know, Javan will be there a lot of the time. And people say, yo, what well, go on, big man? What are you telling me? A phone in your face. And you get used to it so much that it just feels normal. But then you're like, but it's not normal. It's not normal. It's not normal. But also, I, I think the thing that I've learned about that is that you can't control the way that people see you oh, or what 100%. their expectations of you actually yes. are. Yes, And in definitely. that, you just kind of have to roll with the punches to a mm. point, obviously. Yeah, you know, yeah, we've yeah, all been yeah, raised yeah, a course. certain way. If it goes past a certain line, then, you know, there's a certain depth that your voice has to hit. Mm. <laughs> and like, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, your yeah, shape 100%. changes. But the reality is, a lot of the time people don't know they're being disrespectful or rude. Mm. They just see an opportunity to talk to someone that they think they'll never see again. Yes. And also, and this is probably testament to your relationship with your audience and how good you are. And that is that they think they know you. Yeah. Stand so when they think is- they know you, they can be ultra comfortable and yes. be in your face. Cause you're Mo, in it. Mm. You're just Mo. Yeah, it's like yeah. when I noticed things changed when I was walking down the street and it wasn't, oh, hey, it wasn't just, people shouting at me it was mm. you're right, Reg and they kept it pushing and they were just saying hello to me like we went school together yeah yeah and it's like 
oh, okay, well, you, you think you know me, wicked. I can yeah. take this, I can roll with this. Mm-hmm. And I, I imagine that it's that for you now because, and probably or definitely a lot quicker because you are making people laugh and that's really powerful stuff mm. because people will try and tell your jokes. They can't tell your jokes. And they go, just watch it too. Yes. And then they're sharing an experience yeah, yeah, yeah. because of something that you've given them. Mm-hmm. And that is a personal relationship. It's like that thing of the man, the man on the, uh, on the couch, right? Mm. As people on television, we have relationships with people that we will never meet. Mm. And they think that they know us mm. because we've made them feel a certain way when no one else was in the room. Yeah. Therefore, there is a relationship there. Mm. But we're looking into a camera yeah. And they're looking at our faces. Mm. So it will always be weighted heavily in one side, yes. to one side, sorry. Mm. And the minute that you make peace with that, mm. you can't get mad at somebody going, yes, Mo, let me talk to you quickly. Oh yeah, 100%, man. You know? I, I know definitely with myself, when it comes to doing, I think now when I, now I'm at a place where I just, I like being back on stage now. Love it. So when it comes to doing shows last minute, like we do shows for five pounds <clears> because <throat> the money doesn't mean nothing to me in that sense mm. because it's like I just want to perform so whenever we do last minute shows I'm always making sure my audience you know people say oh bro I'll try to get tickets I'll never get tickets so I'm like cool let's put on a small show down at Greenwich Mo Gilligan and friends get a couple people in cheap tickets five pounds because I, I want people to come yeah. I'm not at a place where I'm like boy gotta wait to the O2 70 pound tickets because I'm like I know the people that watch my stuff I know the people that come up to me in the street I definitely think when I look back at those early days when everything first did kick off, it's a part of my 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 journey that I look back at and I did enjoy the, the come up, but it was a big challenge on myself because it was new for myself and everyone around it. It was new for my friends. It was new for my family. It was new for my relationship as well. And I think that's for me was the biggest challenge. Now I'm so away from that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I'm at a place where tabloids can say, oh yeah, let's delve into this guy a little bit. Because at first I was... I'll be honest, this is pity me. I was like, man's untouchable because man can't talk about me, can't find no dirt. And then it gets to a point where you're like, fuck, man, shit. I remember calling my girl from the Queen's nose a dickhead, so <laughs> <laughs> there might be something still. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I think for me, I'm very aware of the place I'm in and the space I'm in, what I say, because being in this position, especially being a black man in this position, I know I it's like I always I always describe it as this thing where like there's some things other comics around me can do mm. and they won't ever face any repercussions. It won't be a conversation, anything. But I know the minute I do it, it can be a comment. And that can be the smallest thing. Oh, yeah. I've done a small video recently and I was talking about holidays. I said, yeah, you know, there'd be some couple from Ipswich, you know, that's just, I, I just needed a place. Ipswich. There's people in the comments, man, why are you dissing Ipswich, man? Da-da-da-da-da. You know, this is on a forum in on, on Facebook. Now we're not going to come to your gigs. Yeah. And I was like, what? I just said Ipswich, bruv. Mm. Like, I'm not dissing Ipswich. Lovely place. I've had a gig there a couple of years ago. Mm. Come to Ipswich, please. I'll, <laughs> I'll be there next year. I've got to ship these tickets. But, <laughs> but it was the realisation that it's like, some of, some of the smallest things you can say can be can be amplified mm. as well. How have you felt that in that, in that place? Because I think sometimes, because you're, <laughs> you know what it is, Wedge, yeah? Because there's times where, you know, when the, when I done a documentary, mm. uh, KG was like, yeah, you know, Mo, you're, you're the new Reggie Yates, bruv. You're the new, you're the new Reggie Yates, bruv. You're going to be in Africa holding the baby cuts. <laughs> holding the baby cuts. <laughs> and it was really funny. <clears throat> and there's a part of me where I was like, oh, I wonder what Reggie Yates thought about that. If you've seen it, I don't know if you've seen no, it. No, no, no. Oh, did yeah. that go out? Was that on it? Yeah, you're going to be that, the new Reggie yeah, Yates. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that went out. I didn't see that. But again, <laughs> I get a lot of people that would say, oh, you're, Mo, you're the new Reggie, cuz. Honestly, I think that's sick. Mm. Um, first of all, I think it's a double-edged sword because completely selfishly selfishly i don't want anybody to say you're the new anyone because yeah. you're mo no 100 you're not you're yeah, not yeah, me yeah, 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 yeah. you're not anybody else you're not anybody that's come before me or anybody that's come in around that's been around out around you and you're you and mm. you are unique so i would hate for anybody to call you the next anything mm. me or otherwise mm-hmm. um but i think what was said was said in in love and that yes. is that yeah, 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 yeah. there is a certain um i don't know a place that he's put me Mm. Um, and he's saying that you are there or you're surpassing it or you're going there or whatever. Mm. And it's a positive thing Mm. because I found myself in spaces that nobody like us has ever been before. Mm. And you are in spaces that nobody like us has ever been before. So in a way he is right. You're doing 
what I've done and continue to do in your way. And that's mm. flipping beautiful, yeah, but you're yeah. not me, you're mm. you. Mm. And I don't want anybody to ever confuse you with Munya or or me with it. Do you know what I mean? It's mm. like, we all work too hard to be called the next blah, blah. Yes, yeah, yeah. You know, you've, you've worked so hard to be you. How dare anyone say you're the next mm. blah, blah. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? No, Let alone me. So I, I think in, in a lot of ways, it's a beautiful thing that you are, breaking new ground and you're doing things that no one else has done. And, you know, if if they are saying that because I've done a similar thing, you're the new me, then sick. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, the, the people I always get compared to, uh, Richard Blackwood. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Richard Blackwood or yourself. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think that they've always been the names of people who said, yeah, bro, you're, not, you're, mm. you're basic. Because especially having a, you know, when you when you get that shiny floor show, yeah. You know, again, when I when I started doing the documentary, I dated back, and it was like, oh, right, Reggie. I mean, not Reggie. Um, Richard was the last person to have a show mm -hmm. twenty years ago, and when I watched Richard's show, I got a lot, I got a, I needed inspiration, but yeah. I needed inspiration from a place where like I can't get inspiration from you know the shows that are on now because yeah. they don't look or sound how I'd want my show to sound. Mm. So that's where I started watching a lot of Richard's old show, and I was like, oh, cool, man. Yeah, man, that's the kind of vibe I want. Mm -hmm. And I said it to Richard recently. You know, your show was a show by black people for black people, yeah. in a sense. It's a show when, you know, watching it back, you see some of the old clips and it's like, right, this is people who don't normally get to go to a yeah. TV show, who are going to a TV show and feel like, yeah, like I'm here. I feel like I'm at a real show, not just the, mm. I'm going to laugh and I'm going to clap and all that mm. kind of stuff. But uh, when I started to get into that kind of documentary space, especially, I watched a lot of your documentaries. Oh, well, okay. And I think the main inspiration I got from watching your your documentaries is that sometimes you go into real challenging places, right? Or you talk about very challenging things, but you do it in a beautiful way where you feel like I'm with you on this journey. Right. Now, every person who makes a documentary is different. You know, Lou Ferru likes to, I feel like he likes to prod a little bit, asks questions mm -hmm. and sits back. But I felt when I was watching Reggie, because I'm like, right, like being a black man in the space that you're in, mm -hmm. like some of the places you've been, I'm like, does it change the dynamic of making the documentary absolutely. automatically? Do absolutely. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's why I'm not making as much of them anymore mm. because I'll do things so long as they're challenging. Mm. I'll do things so long as I'm learning. The minute I stop learning and it becomes muscle memory, I'm not interested anymore. Mm. And documentaries are a beautiful thing because you are forced to learn mm. if you really care about the process. You can wing it, but you can actually learn and actively expose yourself mm. in the process for the right reasons in the right way. Yeah. And that way people go on a journey with you. And that's mm. definitely what I did in documentaries around the world. Mm. Um, but now um, the challenge that I, I am sort of putting on myself is to tell our stories holistically. Mm. So like outside of me going, okay, I'm going to go to, um, I'm going to go to a corner of America where there's been a race issue and make a documentary about Mike Brown, for instance. Right. Mm. Great. A million people have done that. I'm going to do it my way. What does it look like if I sit down with my laptop and I write a script about race that challenges people in a way mm. and that speaks to my personal experience, but I craft it so beautifully that when you watch it, you feel something. And when you see it, you see faces and you see experiences that speak to yours mm. in a really beautiful way. Yeah. Yeah how 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 much will that affect or change the conversation? How much can that shift the narrative mm. outside of me turning up somewhere with a camera and hoping mm. that we have an interesting and challenging moment yes. caught on camera? Mm. So my attitude has shifted now in terms of where I see the power lie in terms of storytelling. There is an amazing, amazing thing that can be done from making the documentary, but in terms of writing and directing a drama, a movie or a TV show, that for me is the exciting thing that for me mm. is the new challenge and that's where i am now and some of those documentaries one of my favorite ones is when you went to south africa yeah yeah and you visited the church because that i've been to south africa <laughs> and <laughs> for me i remember the, when we first was gonna because i was out there doing football coaching so before we went you know like we, we're with this charity and stuff we had this talk he said, you know, guys, if you do get kidnapped, you know, <laughs> it was all these things, you know, they had insurances. If you do get kidnapped, you know, this is the amount of money that we can have for any kidnapping and stuff. And it's like, right, like we're just there to do football coaching. Yeah, you, know, no, really, it's real though. you guys are really scaring us right now. Yeah. But then when I got there, I was like, wow, this South Africa for me, and I'll always say this is one of the best places I've ever been in the world because 
There's a lot of people, especially where we went, we went to Joburg, just outside a little place called uh, Cosmo City, mm -hmm. yeah? So how Cosmo City was, basically, it was a white guy who had loads of land. The government bought this land off him. Bleh, loads and loads of land. Then they built, basically, housing developments on it. And then how it is, it's kind of put up in, like, districts as such in South Africa. So what you can kind of do is like buy a bit of land and you can build your house on it. Mm. So within this area of Cosmo City, there was people that had wicked houses. Then there's other people that are basically living in small sheds. Mm -hmm. Like that is the difference of it. But there's a supermarket there and there's everything else there. But it's it's basically land that was there as nothing. And now there's, there's people there. And I think the beautiful thing, what I liked about South Africa, that they didn't need anything. You know, sometimes I was at a stage when I was, I was really into my trainers, mm. collecting my trainers. I was close to like 200, maybe 300 pairs around that time. I'm buying double pairs, triple pairs. You know, Nike is saying, boom, we're doing these exclusive ones. I'd go there, camp out. And that was all I was focused on was like, I need the exclusive ones right now. And going there at that time was a huge shift because I was like, I'm sitting there with 300 trainers in my house. Some double pairs, triple pairs. Whereas people over here, they don't even care about that. They're so not bothered. I think the beautiful thing I loved about it was that was my intro that was my introduction to South African house. Yeah. And listening to this sound, which was like, rah, this is a vibe. Everyone mm. just liked it. Yeah. Going to parties out there, had a braai, they just bit of meat, some pap, and that was it. Yeah. And I was like, this is it. Yeah. This feels like Special. utopia a little bit. It's the closest thing I think I've ever got to for like a Wakanda. Yeah. <laughs> now that sounds like a big statement, but Everyone was just happy doing their own thing. Can I, can I completely blow your mind on something? Because you've touched on several things that have happened in my life in yeah. one story that's really, really mad, right? So mm. I've, I've been to different parts of South Africa for uh, the documentaries that I've made. And um, the first doc that I made was in uh, Kenya, right? Kibera, mm. the biggest slum in, in that corner of Africa, right? Yeah. And um, uh, I was living there for a week. Blah, blah, blah. I made this documentary, came home. Mm. At that time, I was... Um, I was living in, in Hybra or whatever. It was a two bedroom house that I had, right? And when you walk in the door, you had the guest room. Mm. And that was where I kept all my shoes. And at that mm. point, like I was savage. Like, you know, you said that you're into shoes. Like anybody that knows me knows that I was into shoes and I've come out the other side now. I don't really play that game anymore. But yeah. at that point I had about 3000 pairs of shoes. Ooh, and I kid ooh. you not, I kid you not, that's TV not- TV money was good. <laughs> no, yum, but, this, yum. but this is the thing, right? I grew up with nothing. Yes. And Puma, Adidas, Reebok and Nike were all giving me free stuff. Yes. So of course I'd say yes to everything. 100%. And then I would buy everything. Mm. And this was- before sneaker culture is what it is now. So mm -hmm. it was either Crooked Tongues or nothing. And if you know sneakers in London, you know about Crooked Tongues. 100%. And if you know Magdi, you know about like what he did with Slamming Kicks and blah, 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 blah. And just like what was built around that community was was beautiful and it was a community. And I was part of that community and I, I had and bought and did this, that and the other. Anyway, I came back from this slum and I walked past this room and I came back and I looked in this room and saw 3000 pairs of shoes and I felt sick to my stomach with myself. Mm. So I made a call and the next day I had this guy with a white van come round and I said, take what you want. And they took 2000 pairs of shoes from me. They just mm. literally threw them in. They didn't know what they were. These are like rare Jordans, Espo, my Espos went. You know what Espos are? Oh. It's an Air Force Two. You know what Air Force Two oh, is? Oh yeah, it's, about, it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, a clear yeah. plastic Air Force Two that Pharrell designed and it comes with oh, a blue sock. Rob, what? They went everything, <laughs> yeah. original flipping ice creams, everything. Like all of that era, yeah. all of them went in there and they were just taken to Kibera and they were given mm. to kids, right? Yeah. That's so and, mad because that's what I've done with my crepes. Right. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. Because you recognise that those things that you have are ridiculous. Mm. Having 3,000 pairs of shoes, regardless of what your story is. Oh yeah, oh, I used to wash my trainers every week because I only had one pair of Reebok pump, <laughs> yeah. whatever. I wasn't the only one that came up in that way. I wasn't the only kid that came up on single parent, like flipping free school dinners, whatever. I, I'm not the only one that went through that nonsense. But that doesn't, so that doesn't justify me going, I'm gonna have everything because I can't have everything. Mm. And from that point on, like my relationship with consumerism just sort of shifted massively. Mm. Don't get me wrong, I love clothes, I love shoes, um, but I don't take every free thing that's given to me. I don't buy every pair of shoes now. And a lot mm. of that came from my experiences on the documentary because we talk about poverty in this country. And then when you go to somewhere like a slum and you see poverty, mm. it just redresses the balance and you recognize how privileged you actually are. Yeah. Like even the fact that we have a welfare state, you know, it just, like we had free school dinners, mm. you know, I was around kids in Kibera who, if their parents didn't have money, they didn't have dinner. 
period. Mm. You know, they couldn't afford to go to school because school ain't free. Mm. So it just really just put a lot of things into context for me. And the shoes were symbolic, you know? Yeah, I still had a thousand pairs and I'm still getting rid of them now. I still got like a couple of hundred pairs of shoes. I don't need a couple of hundred pairs of shoes. If you're a size 10, holler at Mo, he'll connect us. I don't need it. I don't want it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, Seven and a half, eight. <laughs> <laughs> and, and honestly, I think documentaries can be a really beautiful thing in terms of what you share with the audience and what you learn with the audience. Mm-hmm. But if you don't take something from it yourself, it's a wasted opportunity. Mm. And I feel as though I've learned as much as I can from that, which is why I've pivoted to something else now. And you've gone all around the world in your docs from yeah, yeah, Russia yeah. to China. Yeah, as I said, I think the South African one is so that I remember when that came out, I think that was around the time I just went to South Africa. Okay. So I know how important religion is there as well. Yeah. yeah. And anywhere with poverty, really. Yeah. But I think why that was also my favorite, because we're with you on that dock at that time. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, you're very much like, right, I feel like the pastor's exploiting it. Red, tear, tear. And then there's one bit where he's like, Reggie, humble yourself. <laughs> you're in South Africa. And it's almost, you see a shift where you, where the, and you say, you're like, well, yeah, like this is, this is where I'm, I'm here and this is how it works here. Mm. What is it like going into some of those places? Like. Uh, it's challenging because you go in with preconceptions, right? So mm. you go in thinking that you know it all. And then when you get there, you recognize that the rules are very different. Mm. And that was what happened with South Africa. I was appalled and disgusted by this man who was making his millions off the back of his congregation Mm. who had nothing. But the reality was he was selling hope. Mm. And that makes me feel uncomfortable. Uh, I wouldn't ever ever want to be in that level of exchange with anyone, particularly someone living through poverty. Mm. But for them, it was a fair exchange. And I have no right to judge Mm. that situation. And I went in judgmental. And, yeah, you know, yeah. when he told me to humble myself, I got annoyed, obviously, because I was like, what are you talking? Like, <laughs> yeah. Humble myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then you step back and you go, actually, no, um, maybe I should look at this from another perspective. And the minute I did, I was able to understand it better. And it wasn't about me licking his boots or, mm. you know, sort of going, oh, actually, you're right and I'm wrong. Mm. It was more about understanding that world and understanding the way that the people there had a relationship with him and with their faith. Mm -hmm. It's different, you know, not everywhere works the way that home works. Yeah, and how we want it to work as well. Absolutely. You know, have you ever had any challenges when you've done some of these documentaries, like things where you're like, whoa, I almost got shot. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, a bunch of times. (laughs) And and it sounds like ridiculous me being so flippant about it, but you kind of have to like, you have to have this, 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 um, this mindset when you go in that anything can happen, but it's not gonna happen to you. Otherwise you would just stay in your hotel and not do anything, you know? Yeah. So I sort of went into a lot of those quote unquote scary or edgy environments, just believing that I was going to be okay, even though, uh, you know, there was a real danger there. Mm. That's the only way that you can make the program because one of the biggest things that I learned during that pastor film in South Africa was, it's not about me, it's about the story. Mm. And when I stopped putting myself in front of the story, the story got better. Mm. And if you worry and you allow yourself to a point, obviously you're not going to put yourself in any crazy environments or situations, but if you worry to, a, if, if you worry too much, you stop being loose and being in the moment and actually asking the question that is pertinent to the moment and the person, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I, I, you kind of get over that. Yeah. You have to. And in your career, have you ever found there's been like gatekeepers? Because I feel like you've been in this game for 30 years and you know, like anyone's career, you get, Yes is at the right time. Mm. You get no's at times where even in my career, I look back and I'm like, maybe that no was kind of right because yeah, I yeah. weren't ready to do that. But have, have you ever felt like in this industry, there is gatekeepers that have blocked you from doing certain things? Yeah, like everyone. Um, but mm. I'm thankful for the no's because mm. I have got to a place where I will work so hard that if you're saying no, you got to mean it, mm. you know, and it's got to come from a right place because I'll take it next door. Yeah. If it's a no from you, be sure it's a no. Otherwise I'll take it next door. And that's where I am now because I don't present anything that doesn't represent me in the best way possible. Mm-hmm. And if you're going to say no, be sure. Yeah. And the minute that you get momentum, like I'm, I'm, at, I'm at page one on a new, a whole new book now as a writer director, right? Yeah. That's hard. Mm. That really is hard because I've got, so far in my career as a host, like I'm not doing entertainment anymore, but you know, I, I left Saturday night. I got so far as a documentary maker and I won the awards and stepped away. 
And now I'm gone back to zero, page zero. And now I'm saying to people, no, give me three million an hour to make my documentary, my, my drama, sorry. Mm. <laughs> documentary like three million an hour. <laughs> but you know, like the dramas that you watch on television and love, like they're like three million an hour now. Like it yeah. used to be a million. And now when you get co-pros, you get American production companies coming, like Small X is easily four or five million an hour, whatever it is, right? Mm. They're expensive and they yeah. cost money. So for somebody to invest that in you, because I ain't, I ain't got that money. Mm. I ain't got three million an hour to spend on that. It's yeah. not me. It's not my money. So when someone else is paying, you got to come correct. Mm -hmm. And if they're going to spend that money on you, you've got to be better than the next 10 people that are saying to them, how about this idea, yeah. you know? So um, yeah, people in the past have definitely said no, but all of the no's that I've had, I've been thankful for mm. because they told me either I wasn't ready yet or they weren't ready. Yeah. So I needed to get ready to the point that they couldn't say no again. Mm. And and it's, it's 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 been a really beautiful turnaround because when the person that has said no several times goes, please come with me because I'm saying yes and I haven't even seen what you've got to offer yet. Yeah. It's a beautiful place to be. Yes. I, I've always found like some of those no's are, there's there's no's I've had in my career. I'm like, you know what, looking back, that I, I wouldn't have been ready to do that yeah. then. Yeah. But it's so funny because there's a guy who goes around telling people, oh yeah, you know, um, so there was a show and, you know, he's told my, my, my manager, Polly, he's like, oh, look, you know, I'd love, I'd love to get Mo on this show, but I haven't, I hadn't seen him. You know, I spent a lot of my early career of like, How does, I, can he do it? You know, my manager's like, yeah, of course he can do it. Like, <laughs> like he's sick, like he can do it. Yeah. He's like, oh, I want to see him though. I want to see him. So, you know, I had this show in Greenwich. Um, so he's come to the show. So when I know someone's in the room, I'm like, all right, cool. I'm gonna just turn it up turn a up, level. Yeah, yeah. Because whenever I perform anyway, I always have this thing where, I, one, I wanna make everyone laugh in the room, mm. but I was still at a stage in my career where I need to be remembered. Mm. And I was writing a lot of material where I was like, you're gonna remember this. Mm -hmm. I want this to be material where, I've seen this guy the other day, I can't remember his name, but he done this kind of joke. Mm. Just so it gives you something where he's like, ah, oh, maybe he's, what's his name? It, I, was, I was literally making it, I spent, most probably about a good two, three years after I kind of left Sunday show, creating bits of material that I I literally just almost finished doing last year for the mm. Netflix special. Mm. A lot of that material was all stuff where I was like, yeah, cool. People remember this. Mm. If you don't like this bit, but they might remember that. So I remember getting to the show, you know, my manager's like, yeah, cool, man. Have a good one. Don't be nervous. Just go out there. I'm like, cool, man. I'm a person where you see pressure, right? I've grown up in an environment where it's like, like no one, like we didn't have a lot, mm. but we didn't know we was poor. Yeah. So there never felt like a pressure to have certain things. You just grow up being like, right, I love a Nike tracksuit, but if I can't get one, it's calm, isn't it? Mm. So I didn't have this level of pressure that I used to get from stand up comedy. I just wanted to be good and be the best in the room. So I think for me, when I used to perform, because I didn't have that pressure, I was just like, I need to be the best mm. because... I just can't be nervous. I have no time to be nervous. <laughs> so even now to this day, I don't face nerves. I get a bit anxious. I get a bit like, I want to do it now. Yeah. But nerves is like, I ain't got no time for nerves, bruv. Yeah. You got to record this show, bruv. That's the last thing I'm worried about. So, I, you know, I get out of this show now, smashed it, like smashed it. And there's a lot of times when I'm performing and I can see him in the room. So there's a, a couple of glances where I'm like, oh, he's laughing at that bit. Watch this bit. So, you know, my last joke, I used to do the slow motion thing, right? So I'm like, yeah, and left, left, and then you do it like that. That used to be like, you know, when The Rock does the people's elbow. <laughs> as a finishing move. Yeah, as a comic, you have your, whoa, this is yeah. what, what you, you guys are laughing none of the other stuff. Watch when I do this bit. Yeah. So then, um, you know, I was just like, oh, what did he think? You know, two, three days later. Yeah, yeah, he really liked it. Um, yeah, he said he'd be in touch, you know. He said he was great. And then it turned out, it was like, yeah, most great, just don't really know what to do like with him. And it said, I was getting polite no's, mm -hmm. which was very frustrating for me because everyone's saying you're really good, but mm. no, you're like, just say I'm shit. Like yeah. just say you weren't good enough. Yeah. Now he goes around telling everyone, yeah, you know, I was the guy that, you know, said no to Mo Gilligan. Gosh, what was I thinking, man? <laughs> and there's a part of me that fills me with a bit of joy yeah, <laughs> when yeah. I hear that. But at the same time, I wasn't meant to have that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's a, it's a nice bargaining to have. You go tell everyone that you denied me, mm. but at the same time, I'm like, it's calm though, isn't but it? You know, it's really interesting having this conversation now mm. because I am at that stage. Yeah. 
in this new part of my career, which is really weird and also a fantastic sort of uh, refresher slash wake up call slash smack in the face where people are saying no. Yeah. Because I got so used to what documentary do you want to do next? Mm. It's commissioned. Yes. Just tell me what you want to do. We're doing it. Yeah. Right. So to walk away from that yeah. to, uh, I spent the last six months writing this thing. I poured everything I have into it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I don't have time to read it, you know. So yeah, yeah. no. Why yeah. don't you go back to do what you do? And how, and how were you finding writing? Because everyone writes differently. Yeah, absolutely. So how, how, how are you finding love this it. process of writing? It's the most, well, the writing and then going on to direct because mm. there is a distinction. So um, to give you some context, I had three green lights in a week, right? And that's not like, that doesn't happen. That's yeah. very rare. And to, to be even more clear, I've been writing for 10 years, mm. quietly, sharing script with my team, them going, that's dead. Don't ever show that to anyone else. Come again. Yeah. Sharing it to my friends, them going, all right, yeah, you might want to read a few more books, bruv. Like, yeah, yeah. All of that's happened over the last decade. And then I got my my first feature film as a writer, director, greenlit, the same week as I had uh, Make Me Famous, which is a drama that I, I wrote for the BBC mm-hmm. and uh, a script for a show that... Um, Hopefully I'll have some news on shortly, a TV show, a drama, right? A serial yeah. drama series, all in the same week, all green lit, right? And they wanted to shoot, make me famous at the same time as Pirates, my mm-hmm. film. Mm-hmm. And so I couldn't direct both, Yeah, but I was slated to direct both. Yeah. So I had to make a decision and obviously I'm going to do my first feature film, right? Mm. So I wrote this drama about the relationship between uh, suicide and reality TV. Mm. and our relationship with fame as yeah. an audience, right? Do you mind me asking, what, what made you want to write that? Um, I'll be totally honest. They came to me and they said, we'd love you to write this thing. And I was okay. like, I'm so excited to do this because I'm perfectly poised to write this. Mm. I've presented reality shows. I've been on TV for a long time and I've seen every kind of celebrity you can think of come and go. Yeah. From pop stars to reality stars to whatever, because I presented those shows. I was interviewing the Spice Girls at 12 years old. Mm. I was talking to Five on album one and then on the album where they were desperately trying to get some sort of notice or some sort of attention yeah. and nobody wanted to book them. We booked them because someone canceled and then you see how different they are versus album one when they're too hot and they don't even want to look at you in your face. Wow. Like to see people go through that trajectory, I've seen that over and over again in music, mm. in celebrity, in drama, in TV, in film, in all these different things. So to be able to put all of that in a script, especially with this new era uh, affected and influenced massively by social media was like a huge opportunity for me. I was itching to, itching to write it, but also I was itching to direct it because the lead character I created was a fictional character, mm. but he was an amalgamation of a lot of the boys I grew up with. Mm. It just so happens that this boy was confident and cocky enough that he ended up on a reality TV show. Yeah. And there was a certain way that I wanted things to go with that. And it went in a different direction because I was a different director and it did beautifully. You know, the guy's getting nominated for awards now and fingers crossed we'll get nominated for some big awards when, you know, the new year turns around. Mm. Um, And there is a huge legacy for that show. And I really wanted to own it, you know, like murdered by my father, murdered by my boyfriend. It's the same sort of, it's the same strand, you know? Um, So to produce it and to write it was a privilege, but I really wanted to direct it and I Mm. had to let it go. Mm. At the same time, I'm having the most amazing experience directing this film that I love, but I'm looking at this other project and I'm going, it's happening at the same time and I want to be involved. And it's a painful thing, but it's a beautiful lesson to let certain things go, Mm. to know that certain things you can only control to a point. But at the same time, there are some things that you can really holistically own Mm. and own them as a success or a failure, but it's all a learning experience. Yeah, because I think that's kind of one thing I, I think I struggle with because... Being a stand-up, yeah. when I'm on stage, it's me. It's me that's going to get on stage. It's me that might make him laugh. Mm. Me that might make him not. So <laughs> getting into the creative space that I've kind of brought myself into when it comes to making videos, I've done it all myself, cut up the videos myself. Then I'm like, oh man, it's got to sound like we're in the street. How can I get street sounds? Well, YouTube, ambience. Mm. I would do all these things. Mm. So like the more TV and stuff I do, it's hard because sometimes I'm like- you no, got to share you- it. Yeah, but it's like, mm, I don't think we should do that. I was like, well, what? we're going to do it. And I'm like, mm. but no, <laughs> I am saying no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, and it's hard because I am in a place where people do trust my creativity, mm. where they're like, cool, like, I trust what you're saying. And there has been instances where we've done certain things and I'm not being happy with it. And I, I know, I, you know, I've been very vocal, like, why did we do this? I said it wasn't going to work and it didn't work. 
And then we've kind of had another c- couple weeks and be like, cool, now it works. Mm. Told you. So it's hard because then I'm like, see, I told you. Yeah. If you wouldn't have it my way, it would have happened. But the, the unfortunate truth is the bigger it gets, the more collaborative it has to be. 100%. And yes. uh, if you are willing to sit at the top of the tree and say, you know what, we're doing it this way, you've also got to be willing to take the licks when you're wrong. Yes. And that's the thing that I'm learning now mm. because uh, film is a director's medium. And if you are a guy with your name on the tin of a show, mm. the Mogillion show, you know what I mean? Yeah. You can own it as much as you want, mm. but you also have to take the licks if stuff doesn't land. Yes. Or if you offend someone or if mm. it goes wrong or, you know, or you don't deliver on time. Because it's your face. It's your face. It's your face. It's your name. And you're also pushing people to dance to the beat of your drum. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, we, we celebrate ownership, but we don't really talk about the stuff that comes with it. Mm. You know, the yeah. responsibility, paying for office space, all the mm. stuff that comes with ownership. Yes. We don't really get into the woods of that. Mm. It's a, and it's a lot. Do you know what I really liked about Make Me Famous, yeah? I was thinking you about saw it, it now. Yeah, I was. I watched Make Me Thank Famous. Thank you for watching. Yeah, Appreciate yeah, yeah. it. Thank you very that, much. Man. Do you know what I really liked about it, yeah? There was things that I felt like I could see for myself in it. So yeah. when he was talking about, you know, when he first, especially when he first really kind of got famous and people said, like, oh, let me get a picture, bruv. And he's in the shop. There's that scene where he's in the shop. And the guy's <laughs> like, right, that's you, yeah? Let me get a picture, cuz. And you're like, big man, I just want to pay for the, I just want to pay my bread and milk. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. And then, that, so that's why I think watching parts of it back, I was like, wow, this feels like when everything kind of happened for me a little bit. Yeah. But why it was also really interesting is because reality TV for men and women is totally different now. Absolutely. You know, women can make a lot of money through it. Don't get me wrong. Obviously still go through, you know, the kind of same mental health issues and stuff. But for men, it's totally different. And it's weird because as soon as I seen that, and I've always thought it, when I look at male you know, reality stars now, I'm like, whoa, are you all right, bruv? Is everything okay? Yeah, because, so. you know, as again, if you're a woman, women buy into women. So if you're, you know, you've come off this show and you're like, I'm going to do something with this brand, I'm going to do something with that brand. They're like, oh, I love the way she wears that. Men, that doesn't happen. Doesn't matter what dungarees you're wearing, brother. Man ain't buying them dungarees, <laughs> blood. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I think that's what's so hard. Yeah, yeah. You know, for men coming into this world of, you know, it's like, it's reality. And, you know, cause I, I've, I've met some of the, the, the male guys that have gone on to, you know, do well and stuff. And I'm so like intrigued to be that, like, but how, how was that? And mm. everything happened. You know, I'll go one step further. I think that that's the case for uh, entertainment as a whole. Mm. It's not just reality TV now. I think mm. because of social media, because of our relationship with the audience, because it is so direct, because Joe Bloggs could DM you and you might actually see it. Mm. like the playing field is the same now yeah, you know yeah, it's like 100%. you could dm beyonce and she might actually read it mm. drake's following you like yeah. the, the, the internet has made it a level playing field no matter mm. where you are in the world mm. therefore if you are a, an internet celebrity a reality tv star a movie star or the biggest musician ever the access that people have to you is the same which also means the potential for them to hurt you in terms of what they say mm. is the same regardless of whether you're big in this circle or whether you're big globally. Mm. So it's never been a more precarious time to have a level of fame, let alone if you've come to it for the wrong reasons. You know, if you've got a talent and you get fame off the back of it, let's say you're Ariana Grande, it's undeniable that that girl can sing. She can sing, Mm. she's got a talent. But if you're on a reality show and that's over, what's your talent? Mm. You look good. Yeah. Cool, okay, cool. You you put the pictures up, you do the boohoo, whatever, you look good. Mm. congratulations what happens next and Mm. that's where the pressure comes in and that unfortunately is the thing that i found through research for make me famous that a lot of these kids that go into it don't think about and that's where you get into really dangerous territory but i think what was successful about the show and i'm really proud of is that it started a conversation and like i said you know the best documentaries i make i did make some rubbish ones the best ones started a conversation the family Mm. would turn off the tv or mute it and they'd have a conversation on the couch, mm. even if it was a husband or wife or someone would call their partner or their bedroom or it would be in a group chat. People would talk about an issue because they were with me on a journey. When Make Me Famous finished, my DMs blew up. Mm. And people were having conversations on social media with their families on their couch. I got so many messages from people saying, I've had the best conversation with my dad I've ever had because oh. of that show, because my dad doesn't want me on social media. And mm. we talked about it and I finally understood what he meant. Mm. And, and, and that is when communication through creativity, I guess, becomes incredibly powerful. Mm. And that's where 
I believe that what I've learned from documentaries now, taking that to drama, could lead to some really important stuff. And it's also making a change as well. You know, there's certain changes that will start happening within some of these industries. Mm. And I think that's one thing I really did learn about, you know, when I was making my documentary is like, can we get some change out of this? Mm. Even if it's just changing one person's life, but something within the industry that I'm in, that the landscape changes somehow, Mm. you know? Um, And now... You're doing pirates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so looking forward to this, you know. That's you know that's why? Cool. Because because I see the I see the picture for it. And also I remember we were speaking about I think you was telling me he's like, look, I'm making this, I'm doing this film. Yeah. yeah. And like you gave me like a brief thing about what it was about. It was based kind of kind of like on yeah, yourself. Loosely basically. on me and me and my friends growing up. Very um, loosely. And when I heard the idea, I was like, This sounds sick, man. <laughs> like, so um yeah, like, can you, can you, is there anything you can tell us about yeah, no, it? Yeah, no, no, I've got nothing to hide. If I'm honest, um, I'm talking about it as much as I can because yeah. I'm incredibly proud of it and I want everyone to go and see it. It's, um, it's a coming of age film. You know, mm. we grew up on films like Stand By Me, films like House Party, which on one level are about, in House Party's case, the party, the fun, the dancing, the girls, but really it's about their friendship. Yeah. It's about growing up. Stand by me. Oh, we're going to go and find a dead body. No, it's not about the dead body. It's about the journey. And it's about them coming of age on the way. Them yeah, actually yeah. being honest about their friendship and about who they really are, or who they're becoming as young men. Mm. I feel as though we here in the UK haven't really had that where you've got three men of color on the screen and they're not, victims of circumstance, mm. you know, or they're not victims full stop. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They are in the bits. Yeah. So stuff might be going on, but that doesn't define them. You know, mm. in, in my film, there isn't a gun or a knife in it. And that is not to, to say that there is no value in telling those stories because those stories are important. And we've all experienced things that we've seen on the big screen and on the small screen from filmmakers that look like us. And those stories are important and need to be there. But there is also another story that hasn't been told yet. You know, mm. not all of us grow up wanting to be a bad boy or, or yeah, want to yeah. be in the, in the mix of that. I think that's why I, I was really drawn towards it. When you told me about the idea. Yeah. I was like, yeah, man, that just sounds fun. Yeah. If it's like, a, you know, those kind of feel good films. Yeah. But you can imagine... You know, I think for me, I always say, you know, like black British talent is really going to get out and we really start exporting it to the world. Mm. And I always felt that, you know, we've, we've had, you know, other films and stuff go out. But when I went to the States last year, when Top Boy had come out, mm. the conversation was so different because it went from, yo, y'all, y'all drink tea out there? Like when I'd go previously before to like, yo, man, y'all top boy? Whoa see that and i'm seeing billboards mm. on sunset boulevard mm-hmm. and it was the thing of like wow like we can make you know stuff to the level of you know okay it's maybe not the level of say like the wire no but we always but, have been able to but do you know what it's what was nice about it yeah is that people was finally like well i didn't know it was like that mm. and it's like this is real this yeah. is a reality Obviously, it's drama's fiction in it, mm. but it felt and looked like London and sounded like London. So I think it's a generational thing. I think, as I said earlier, you know, uh, the generation that came before us wanted to compete with America, let's be honest, mm. by replicating. Mm. You know, there were British rappers with American accents. Yeah. You know, now we are doubling down on our uniqueness. And it's because of that that we are being taken seriously globally, mm. you know. And when you have global platforms, that you and I both enjoy like Netflix. Go on, me, me. <laughs> uh, When you have global platforms like that, you can be seen in Australia simultaneously in South mm. Africa, in, 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 East, in, in East and West Africa, in, yeah. you know, and America. Mm. And um, people are continuously fascinated by worlds that they didn't know existed. Mm. And the version of London that we occupy has never been really shouted about, which is why I wanted to make a, a comedy with dramatic elements, that is period. So mm. this is set in 1999. It's the turn of the millennium. Yes. The entire soundtrack is UK Garage. Yeah. It's about three boys driving from North London, trying to get into Club Coliseum in South London mm. to go to Twice As Nice. Yeah. We recreated Club Coliseum. We recreated Twice As Nice. There's a bag of cameos in it. In a yeah. big club night, it's DJs that you recognise, it's MCs that you recognise, yeah. there's people in the crowd that you'll recognise. Yeah. And every song, when it licks, you go, oh my God. Yeah. And it's throwing a time capsule around the moment that our generation know was special, mm. but it has never been elevated, respected, or put 
on the platform that the entire world can enjoy. There's people in the UK that won't know how special UK Garage was because it wasn't just a bunch of records at 120 to 128 to 132 BPM. Mm. It was Moschino. It was Iceberg. It was mm. Freak FM. It was Fonty, Bushkin, Mighty Mo. It was all of these things before So Solid had a record deal. It was Hanover Grand, it was Leisure Lounge, it was Delight FM, it was Pirate Radio trying to get through the shash, it was standing on one foot trying to get the aerial right. Mm. All of that, that's culture. Yeah. And for our culture and for our history to not be, not be respected, not be loved, not be cherished or be hugged in the way that it deserved to be breaks my heart. Mm. So why can't I be the person that does it for something that I love so much? You know, mm. I was on Pirate Radio. Yeah, I flipping saved up to buy clothes. I would go to Madhouse and go through the Jeez. racks trying to get the verse, the right <laughs> verses, flipping diffusion Versace that I could find and afford. Yeah. I would find the right one. I would write, I would scribble it out in red pen and change the number on it so I'd pay cheaper because I only had 80 pound on me. I would do whatever it took to get stretch off key and I would do it because mm. I knew that I was going to Garage Delight or I knew that I was going to Cookies and Cream. Or I was mm. going to Twice As Nice or whatever. So to be able to recreate Probito, yeah. you know, and have the boys go in there and rob clothes. Like mm. it's, it's Bro, funny. Well, and it's, out some names, boy. If you were there, you'll know, but this is a beautiful thing. <laughs> Yo, if you were there, you'll know. Man, if, you weren't, Probitos, boy. <laughs> if you weren't there, if you weren't there, it's just funny. Yeah. And it's just a group of characters that you can fall in love with. And that's what I really want. I want people to see this Moroccan youth, this Ghanaian boy and this West Indian boy and go, Oh my God, they're just boys. Mm. I just love them. Like, there is no reason why a black kid can't watch the in-betweeners and love them. So why can't it happen the other way around? Yeah. That is such a beautiful way to just round off the podcast <laughs> right there, you know? <laughs> Trust me. Yeah. But honestly, like Reggie, man, it's been such a pleasure just to like have you on the podcast. Every time I ever, I ever see you in a space, I always just want to be like, yo, like, wagwan, man. Because <laughs> you, you're definitely someone that's massively inspired me. But also like someone that myself and there's a whole generation that we've been able to watch the TV and you've kind of, you know, you've held your own, like, you know, 30 years is not, doesn't happen by a fluke. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And it's really inspiring to see, like, where you're like, whoa, like, he's going into films and stuff, which now there's a new generation who, you know, it's like, I'm just going to do film straight away. But it's beautiful to see that you've gone from that, trend, you know, documentaries, music, yeah. film, television, um, and sustain it for 30 years. People always say to me, Mo, like, what's next for you, bruv? What's next for you? I'm like, fam, man's been only been doing this like two, three years, you know? Yeah. But I always tell them it's about sustaining whatever yeah. I have now because as quick as you come, as, as quick as you can go, you know? So um, honestly, dude, it's such a pleasure Honestly, I podcast, genuinely, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for letting me talk for so long. But um, <laughs> yeah. like genuinely, um, what is happening now is so beautiful to see because I remember there being a time when I would sort of look left and right and see one or two faces mm. and they weren't really representing us right they weren't really us like mm. I, I still to this day get people talk about how sick it was to see black boys with braids on the BBC like yeah, you know yeah, in yeah. Air Force Ones and track suits and it's like <laughs> okay that shouldn't be a big deal yes but it was back then mm. and now you've got Target crept and Conan hosting flipping the voice for grime MCs <laughs> yeah. and for flipping drill artists like yeah. that is normal now yes and that's a beautiful thing and that needs to be more commonplace like there is a generation of kids growing up where they expect there to be not just Mo, but an alternative. Mm. And that is a beautiful thing. And I think that that has to continue and it can only continue if we push the boundaries. If you host a, a chat show, if I make a movie, if twin and his brother start a record label, but, but, you know what I mean? And it's, and it's, you know what I mean? It's, it's family. Mm. And then suddenly it's like, Oh, what, what is the office going to look like? Mm. I have a feeling it's probably going to be diverse. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean, and I hate that word. <laughs> but let's use the language that they understand. Yeah, it's going to be diverse. Mm. So who are they going to sign? Mm. And if you're a young MC coming up, where are you going to want to sign? Yeah, you know. And then what happens when there's a production company that looks and feels like that? Mm. What then happens when there's a TV channel that looks and feels like that? Mm. So for me, I believe that we're at the beginning of forever. Um, and I sat next to you know sincere. Yes. I sat next to Sin. Sin's a, a music manager um, and he's doing very well. Look him up. And um, we sat next to each other at this dinner and he said, I feel like where you get uh, where, where, where hip hop in America was in the nineties, mm. where bad boy started to blow up, where people started to really go from the underground, where the lock suddenly were wearing shiny suits. He was like, it feel where, you know, 
like the, the most grimy hood dude could go to number one. Like it feels like that's where we are now here in the UK. Mm. And he's right in music. Mm. But I'd love that to be the case in every corner of yeah. sports and entertainment. Mm. And it's starting to happen. Mm. AJ's got four belts. Yeah. He's man them. Mm. You got a chat show, you're man them. BAFTA. I'm making, he got a BAFTA. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm still working for mine. Do you know what I mean? Um, so it's just really beautiful that we are where we are. And um, long may this show continue. Yeah. Because um, it needs to be out there, man. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, man. Guys, that is... The Mo Gilligan Podcast. If you did enjoy it, make sure you use the hashtag, hashtag the Mo Gilligan Podcast. And yeah, we'll catch you in the next episode. Take care. Peace. Hold up. 